Hello, I'm Pastor Steve Crittenden of Epiphany of Christ Lutheran Church in Apache Junction, Arizona. Thank you for joining us for our worship service on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. And, uh, you know, as we look at our calendar, it uh, uh, has been quite a while. March 1st was the last time that uh, we had worship together in this room. Since then, uh, we had some technical struggles in, uh, to begin with, but we've uh, been able to have these online worship services. But we do look forward to the day when we get to gather again in person to worship our Lord. And your council is working on that. There are discussions going on right now that when things get a little bit cooler in the next uh, month or two, that uh, we be able to hold outdoor worship service. And uh, we don't know exactly yet what that will look like. It could take the look of uh, a parking lot service where uh, people who are close by here uh, can sit in their cars and we would be transmitting uh, the worship service. Uh, we would be doing it outside, transmitting the sound to their car radios. Uh, another possibility is to meet under the awnings of the uh, Friendship Hall in the Education Building and uh, be socially distanced there. Uh, and uh, both of those options will require us uh, to, uh, to buy some equipment, AV equipment that we don't have, and we need to be able to find ways to do that type of worship service, continuing to record it and put it online because we know there are local people that are not going to be comfortable uh, meeting in person yet for uh, worship and we also know that we have viewers literally from around the world we have viewers in canada and throughout the united states and uh, we want to stay connected with you and uh, again these uh, worship services and these ministries that are online are only happening because of the continued giving uh, from your generous hearts and we're so grateful for that you may also remember uh, one of the things that uh, I had said early on in this pandemic was that I wasn't going to shave or cut my hair until we could meet in person again. And of course, I certainly didn't expect that over six months later, we still would be uh, not meeting in person. I couldn't do the not shaving any longer. And uh, so uh, we did have a little fun with, uh, with that and we raised some money and uh, and we had a raffle, and uh, Harold and Chris Baker won that raffle. And, uh, but uh, with regard to my hair, I think I can hang on. I think I can hold out a little bit longer. The worst uh, of the heat of summer is past us, and uh, so I'm going to try. And I had a person ask me, what does that accomplish? What good does it do for you not to cut your hair? And uh, this is sort of a, uh, a morning thing. For me, sort of like rending uh, my shirt or uh, wearing sackcloth. This is a this is a thing of mourning for me, and it's a visual sign of how long it has been. And uh, we look forward to when I can cut my hair again, because we have had in-person worship service. But now, friends, let's begin our worship service for today, and we will do this with our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. In your compassion, Forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. reading is from Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. Why do you mean, what do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness that they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed. They shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Otherwise, iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Word of God, word of life. The psalm today comes from Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. 
Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation, and in you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You are gracious and upright, O Lord. Therefore, you teach sinners in your ways. You lead with the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. The next reading, the second reading, is from Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accordance and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Word of God, word of life. And hear now the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer... And I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. 
And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Sometimes it's just better not to answer a question, even if you know what the answer to the question is. For instance, if a cop pulls you over and the cop comes up and says, Do you know why I pulled you over? Don't say, well, I was going 80 in a 65 zone. I passed a car in, in a no passing zone. Only to have the cop say, well, I pulled you over because you have a broken tail light. Sometimes it just really is better not to answer a question. And I have to tell you that as a student of rhetoric, it's really fun for me to watch Jesus go up against some of these religious leaders, these chief priests and elders, have been outmatched by Jesus with one simple question. Jesus has backed them into a corner. Jesus asked them about John's ministry. Did the ministry of John and the baptism of John, did it come from God or was it of human origin? And they cannot answer the question, not because they don't know the answer, but they know that any answer they give is going to displease somebody. And the religious leaders of the day, uh, they were familiar with this entire God versus human origin tightrope because it's a tightrope that they walked every single day. The chief priests, you see, had a hereditary claim to that position. You could only be a chief priest if you descended from one particular family. And yet at the same time, it was the Roman Empire who made the final choice. It was the Roman Empire that decided who would be the chief priest. So if you wanted to be one of those, then you're going to have to make sure to do things that pleased the empire. And if you were a chief priest, you had to continue doing things. You had to continue cooperating with the Roman Empire. And uh, we have to keep in mind that the emperor never fired anybody. The emperor would execute people that displeased the emperor. And so what we see is that for these chief priests, for these elders, these religious leaders of the people, some of their authority came from God and some of it came from the emperor. And any time they acted, they were aware of what authority they were acting under. And that's why they asked Jesus the question in today's reading. Uh, by what authority do you do the things you're doing and who gave you that authority? Jesus' first question is one that he knows they're not going to be able to answer. But it's his second question that tells us so much. That second question about the sons, which of the sons did the will of his father, the one who said no but ended up doing what the father wanted, or the one who said yes and ended up not doing what the father wanted. Well, when the chief priests and the elders, they heard Jesus ask that question, no doubt they said to themselves, good, here's a question we can answer. This is an easy one. It is the first son who was doing the will of their father. And it is that very answer that they give. It is because of that answer that Jesus condemns them so deeply. And Jesus' response seems to be unfair. They clearly have the correct answer here. It's clear that the one who does the Father's will uh, is the one uh, who does what the Father asks to do. So why is it then that it seems like 
for answering the way they did. These chief priests and elders seem to be on the outside then of salvation. And what we know is that Jesus is condemning them. Jesus is being critical of them for doing the tightrope walk that they do to begin with. They should not be allowing multiple authorities over their lives, and yet they do. And the reason they do is that the emperor will give these guys the authority to do things that God would never give them the authority to do. Things like take a widow's home away from her. Things like selling orphans into slavery. The chief priests and the elders have the authority to do those things. God won't give them the authority to do it, but the empire does give them that authority. And their desire to cling to the authority to do things that God won't let them do, but that the emperor will let them do, that desire causes them to make this declaration just a couple of days later. I'm going to read to you from uh, the Gospel of John. This is in chapter 19, beginning at verse 14. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. We have no king but the emperor? They didn't have to say that. They could have just simply said, this man is not our king. But that's not what they said. They said, we have no king but the emperor, but Caesar. See, they were doing some sucking up to the empire there, forgetting entirely the kingship of God. What they had done then is entirely abandon the authority of God in favor of the authority from Caesar, from the empire. Friends, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, there's a very tough question you have to ask about all of the verbs in your life. The verbs are the words, right, that stand for the things we do. There's a very tough question, and it is, who gave you the authority to do that? That was the question that the chief priests and the elders asked Jesus. Who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus actually narrows that question down, makes it far more meaningful. Does God give you the authority to do that? That's the question that we're invited to to examine our own lives about. Remember, Christ tells us, don't pay attention so much to what your neighbor is doing. Evaluate your own behavior. Look at your own lives. The things that you've done, does God give you the authority to do those things? Think back over this past week with just one issue, just one notion, and that is the way that you talked about somebody else. How did you talk about a difficult neighbor or family member? How did you talk about a political opponent? How did you talk about a protester kneeling at a football game or carrying an assault rifle through the streets? Did God give you the authority to talk that way? Friends, we are all condemned by this lesson that Jesus is teaching. We are either all in on the kingship of God over our lives, or we find ourselves outside the kingdom. Because God refuses to share authority with anyone. 
One of the ways to know whether your behavior is authorized by God is to continue to read and study the Scriptures. Please always be doing that. We're going to look at this more deeply in Tuesday's Bible study. I invite you to join us for that. You can find it at uh, our website, epiphanyofchristlutheran.org, and watch for the email that comes out with the link to it. But there's actually a very simple shortcut that you can use. You can ask yourself this one two-part question. The first part is this, does what I'm doing glorify God? We should ask that about every verb in our life. Everything that we do ought to glorify God. And the second part is this, does it build up the body of Christ? which is the church. That's to say, not just does it make the church bigger, does it make the church better, does it make it healthier? Does it glorify God and build up the body of Christ? All the authority of God does these two things. If not, if what you're doing doesn't do those two things, then you're getting authority from powers that are trying to usurp God's role in your life. And the truth is that the powers that want to do that usurping are so big and so strong and so everywhere. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Because even when we fully cooperate with the usurpers, we are their victims. I want you to closely notice Jesus' condemnation of the chief priests. They answer Jesus' question correctly. And they're condemned for knowing the right answer because they know the truth, and yet they still turn away from God. Remember last week, God told Jonah that God was ready to be merciful to the people of Nineveh who do not know their right hand from their left. God is ready to be merciful on people who are doing harm to God's people because they are ignorant about what they're doing. And yet, the chief priests and the elders, they do know right from wrong. And yet, they still do wrong. And there's a special condemnation. This judgment that Jesus lifts up on them in this reading does not leave even them outside of salvation. We're told, remember, in verse 31, this is what Jesus says to them at the 31st verse. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Ahead of you. They are still going in to the kingdom but it may be later in their lives that they do. And it may be so late that it occurs after they die. But God's power is greater than these, the power of these usurpers. And so even if it doesn't happen until after they die, they still have to suffer through the indignity of watching those that they condemn those who the usurpers value least getting into the kingdom first. But they will get there. Their knees will bend and their tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then the sinners will welcome them into God's kingdom, to God's glory. 
Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In all the world, give your church unity. Inspire all the baptized with the mind of Christ. Where the church is powerful and where it struggles, shape us with humility and obedience so that your love may be at work in us. Lord, in your mercy. Your Son took on all of bodily life in our world, even to death. Preserve and keep your creation, O God. Mend and redeem places that are polluted and damaged, so that all of creation confesses you as Lord. Lord, in your mercy, turn the nations toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority, Lord, in your mercy. Our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected, hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy, turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors, Lord, in your mercy. Thank you 
For those who have gone into heaven ahead of us, likely and unlikely, obedient and slow to learn, by their witness, teach us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord in life and in death, Lord in your mercy. All these things, and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust into your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us many blessings. Send us forth to be blessings in the midst of a suffering world. Through Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, remember the poor.